Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here virtually with all of you. Um, and I was asked to come here and share more about what um, is emerging with decentralized identity. And um, I think in some ways it's early days. Um, it's not like there's a ton of um, adoption of these tools yet, but they are coming. Um, and they're really um, will change the paradigm of how individuals connect with organizations and systems and therefore change the APIs. So um, I wanted to start with a little bit of my own story about how I got involved with decentralized identity is that a group um, with Planet Work met in 1999 and asked, how can we use the web for our common cause? And they brought together 50 environmental groups and they came up with two really unsatisfactory answers. One was that they could build a big portal and everybody could join it. And this is in 1999, remember? Um, or they could all stay with their own separate sites and their separate membership and potentially not really be effective as a collective movement about addressing the challenges that they foresaw. In 2000, they hosted a conference called Global Ecology and Information Technology. And in 2000 and between 2002 and 2000, they, they hosted the Link Tank. And at the time, these were the entities that were going to give us digital identity. Microsoft with its past for Liberty Alliance, like giant corporations handing them to us, or maybe the government and, and the planet work community was like, wait a second, we need to rethink this. We need open standards for user centric digital identity. And they wrote this paper. And this is what they said. Underlying this report is the assumption that every individual ought to have the right to control his or her own online identity. You should be able to decide what information about yourself is collected as part of your digital profile and of that information who has access to different aspects of it. Certainly, you should be able to read the complete contents of your own digital profile at any time. An online identity should be maintained as a capability that gives the user many forms of control. And without flexible access control, trust in the system of federated network identity will be minimal. A digital profile is not treated by the corporations who host them as the formal extension of the person it represents. But if this crucial data about you is not owned by you, what right do you have to manage its use? A civil society approach to persistent digital identity is the cornerstone of the Augmented Social Network Project. And, and in this very long paper, they really propose a, a core proposition that organizations would have their own digital anchors and identities on the internet and people would have their own anchors and digital identities on the internet and they would each be first class nodes on the network and be able to connect to each other on their own terms. And you would have open standards for identities and data exchange happening. So, and, and this, this obviously fits right in the middle between staying isolated and one giant portal, it's one network together. And so I've spent the last 15 years of my life working on this challenge of innovating the protocols to represent people in the digital realm and empower them. And if you, and if you want to think about it um, clearly, uh, like there's identity stuff and personal data stuff and they intersect and they're sort of inseparable, but they're also two different things. And I'm going to focus on the identity side of things for this talk and mention some personal data work that's ongoing that's related as well at the end. So I founded, um, along with some other folks, the Internet Identity Workshop in 2005, and we are the birthplace and nesting ground for a whole bunch of standards, many of which I imagine that you have heard about. OpenID actually was in, you know, first created at our very, very first workshop in 2005, and now is used by billions of people um, on the Internet. But why do protocols matter? And they matter because this is a cover of a book, um, How Control Exists After Decentralization, where these quotes are from, the protocol is a system of distributed management that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer relationships between autonomous entities. Internet protocols allow for interoperation between computers. Protocol is a language that regulates flow, directs nest space, codes relationships, connects life forms. It is 
etiquette for autonomous agents. And that's what we are trying to figure out at the Internet Identity Workshop and the related communities surrounding it is how do we really get people these tools? And I, what I'm going to share with you today is the the breakthroughs that we've had and the early places you can go to adopt it. Like, where are these protocols for the end user in layer eight? So today, or, or the, the web that we've had has this topology where you, the individual, the users go and get an account at every website they interact with, with a new username and a new password. And it divides people up into tons of little bits. And from the developer side of things, it also means like everybody's showing up anew. There isn't necessarily any easy way to go connect back to the user and go, well, what is your music? favorite music and what is your favorite your your body dimensions because we want to support you having a good shopping experience there isn't that connectivity because the people are not first class objects they're all subjected to being underneath websites we also have centralized identity systems and this identity provider model emerged where you know, in part via OpenID, where it was really easy for these large identity providers to say, hey, just use us and we'll intermediate your identity. So this is where you get login with Facebook, login with Google, login with Apple and Amazon, right? And this, you know, it's, it's easy for everybody involved, but it's also ended up being really exploitative. And what we've been working on is these new topologies of identity that are decentralized. So individuals connect, um, the user connects to whatever website or service they're connecting to as a full peer, not as a subordinate or being intermediated by another party. And we use little bit of sprinkles of shared ledgers and immutable data stores to make this happen. And I'll explain more about that as I go through the talk. But at the Thing called a decentralized identifier and it has this format um, where um, I'm on the committee actually at the W3C that is just about to have this standardized and it has two numbers that go with it a public key and a private key for those of you who are involved in crypto currency and blockchain land, um, there's a distinction here where a decentralized identifier is not just a derivative of the private key it is a um, separate number and the, the, the keys can be rotated and the number persists. Um, it has a structure, a key value pair. Each did has a did document and it has within it a did for self description, a set of public keys for verification. And I need to go just click ahead because all of these are live. Ta da. Um, a did for self-description, a set of the public keys, the authentication pro protocols, so how you can challenge the user to see if they actually are in control of that did, the service endpoints for interaction if you want to send them a message or a connect to get data, a timestamp for audit history, and a signature for integrity. And this is what it looks like in real life. Um, you can see I've highlighted the did, the public key, the keys for authentication, the service endpoint, when it was created, updated, and the signature. So some of these go on to shared ledgers. There's a whole variety of different DID methods. Um, each DID method spec um, has the syntax of the method-specific identifier, any method-specific elements of the DID doc, and how you create, read, update, and delete it. There is um, a registry of all the different did method specifications if you want to go and dive in and, and understand them. There's also a universal resolver. Um, the code is at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, so you can go and get it and get it up and running on your own. And there's also a publicly available instance you can send dids to and get them resolved. Some DIDs, on the other hand, stay private and they are in between parties only. And there's two main methods for that, did key and did peer. And they are to support pairwise, agent to agent, encrypted private messaging. And nothing, uh, these don't end up on any ledger. They're just for two parties to connect and talk with each other. 
And there's also a protocol, um, did com did communications that is um, being innovated to support agents talking with each other. And there's a whole community under Hyperledger Aries that is building the agents that speak this protocol. I put in a bunch of the um, API links and actually at the top of my blog, identitywoman.net, you can see all the links that I've included, included in this talk today. Um, the other thing, I'll just um, go back one slide. I also have a note about Chappy, the credential handler API. So it's very explicitly an API that is another way to support the exchange of credentials in between um, parties, which we'll get to it next. So with all of this, I often ask, who cares about really long numbers? Like, really? Like, why? And they're handy for doing cryptography with, but they're not really great for end users or human readable meaning. And so what's been innovated on top of these really long numbers is a system for exchanging verifiable credentials. And this is a challenge that exists in the digital realm, which is how do we prove information about ourselves? How do we prove it when we just have paper? And, and in the digital realm, it's sort of amplified because there is no really agreed upon way to do it. Like sending faxes or photocopies or scans of your documents isn't the way to do it. And one way you could conceivably build these systems is to have a phone home system where to prove something about yourself that a entity like a government is authoritative for, you could imagine APIs, and in fact, India has done this, where you could ping the central database to see if the person claiming they are that person is that person. Um, the problem is this creates a complexity and sort of means that the governments or whoever those um, identity providers, as we might say, are in the middle of your transactions that you don't want them to be. So we have a new sort of uh, new names for these roles um, to support the exchange of this information. We have the issuer, the holder, the individual with a wallet and a verifier. Um, which is where you would share a credential. So an example is a university might issue um, a credential for having saying you've graduated and the verifier might be a um, might be like a potential employer. And individuals have their own little private ledgers that they can append um, their decentralized their did documents to. and then they they can use, they can share a DID with their potential issuer. So I connect with my university. I go, I want you to use this DID that I give you to anchor my credential. And they'll say, sure, prove that you are in control of that DID and challenge you with authentication. And if that works out, they'll be like, great. Now we can use that as the anchor for the credential. The issuer also has to post a DID document with the private key, the public keys that they sign their documents with. And now they can compose a verifiable credential and they can package it all up and send it over to the holder. And a verifiable credential has these components, the credential identifier the did that I mentioned, the claims, credential meta metadata and the issuer signature. So this, an example would be a driver's license. It also could also be something tiny, like I went to yoga yesterday or I came to the API Days conference. They can be really big in their meaning, like you're certified as a doctor in a certain state or really tiny in their meaning. It doesn't matter. This is a universal format for expressing credentials. And then they can share, if I wanna, I have this credential for my university, I can share it with a potential employer. And they do two things. They check that I am indeed the um, owner of that particular did and that the signatures line up and that it was issued by the university. And what's really critical is the verifier does not speak to the issuer. So this reduction in complexity that this technical connection doesn't happen is this is is also a really big innovation from a business perspective and sort of supporting companies being issue things to their customers, their employees, their partners, 
but not having to have them technically federate together. They can just use this data format. Really critical, no PII, personally identifiable information ends up on shared ledgers. It's all stored in these verifiable credentials that are under the control of the individual that it, they are issued to. This technology also has the potential to end usernames and passwords as we know it. Um, they, um, you can, as a, you could, you can just use a did that you generate yourself and use it persistently with the same website. And then they don't have to keep, um, they don't have to store a password for you because they can use DDoS to challenge you when you log in. And that can also happen behind the scenes. So you as the end user aren't really seeing the challenge. It's just happening between your agent and the entity you're interacting with. The other thing this creates is infinitely scalable low cost federation. So if you're paying attention, this fact that you don't have to actually technically connect stuff means that if you speak these new protocols, you can do things that before would have required you to make get like technically connect up to folks you wanted to share information with. And back to the original vision that Planner Work had about organizations having their own identities, you already have folks like the province of British Columbia and the province of Ontario spinning up things like the Verifiable Organizations Network, where the province of British Columbia is issuing the all of the paperwork and records associated with corporations in the province using this format and allowing business owners to pick up their version, their edition of those credentials. So you may be asking like, oh, this is on great new technology, Cleo, like where, who's gonna use it? How is it gonna get adopted? Like, why is it relevant to me? Because I don't see putting together an ecosystem where the, adopting these new things makes sense. So there's this relying party problem, right? And so the great news is, is that back to the beginning of the story, that I shared with you when folks came together at IAW is that OpenID has had huge success. It is um, widely used to support logins across the internet and that the folks have within the community have really worked to innovate and say, how could the existing OpenID relying party code use the OpenID Connect protocol with a few very tiny changes to to actually be able to consume verifiable credentials from individuals' wallets. And so um, the, the, this is called OIDC with self-issued open ID provider. Um, and it has enormous potential. So if you already have open ID um, installed and you're like, what should we do? This is a great way to go in terms of adopting and, and beginning to, to use this technology. And I said um, at the beginning that I didn't have um, time to really go into the data store and the personal data side of things, but I wanted to highlight two things before I wrap up. One is that there's ongoing work um, between the W3C Credentials Community Group and the Decentralized Identity Foundation around um, with the Secure Data Store Working Group and the work on encrypted data vaults and hubs. And I actually co-chair that group. Um, so if you're interested in, in diving into the weeds as we, we develop a standard for that so that every individual can have their own data store and they can port it and, and move it around. And also for developers to be e easily able to access things like a music list or any other type of information that an, an, an end user might be the carrier of their own data and be able to use these tools to support new and more rich interactions. And then you also have the My Data community with their My Data Operators paper that they just published, and they have 48 different companies who are already committed, sort of participating in this ecosystem and moving towards open interoperable standards so that people can move between these data stores. So it's sort of coming at the problem from two different sides, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out um, in the next few few years. And 
again, and maybe these are technologies that you want to wait for them, but you should at least know that they're coming and they pre present really great opportunities once they're really in place. Um, I wanted to list, um, again, some of the companies with APIs in this space. All of these links are actually on um, my website, as I said, at the, um, the it's actually called the API Days Talk link at the top of um, my blog. And here's some more. Um, there is many organizations in this space. Two of them I recommend highly is the Decentralized Identifier and Decentralized Identity Foundation and W3C Credentials Community Group. And then finally, this is me. You can find me on Twitter as Identity Woman. And that's um, my email if you want to connect. And um, the next Internet Identity Workshop we're hosting is October 20th to 22nd. So thank you so much. And I look forward to answering your questions next. Yeah, Renal, well, thank you so much, Kalia. That was a vitally important talk. I mean, it's so important to, uh, to make sure identity stuff is secure and safe for everybody on, on, on the internet. And uh, see if there's any questions, just drop them in the chat for Kalia. We can wait just a second. I have to say, I'm so thrilled at the possibility of maybe getting rid of usernames and passwords, because then I could finally maybe retire uh, the password that I use everywhere, which is you know every website, but it's also for my luggage and my planetary air shield. It's one, two, three, four, five. That's that's what my password. I, I have to stop using it. It's not super secure. Um, but OK, well, it looks like that uh, there's not really any questions coming in on the chat. And I think uh, it is time to head back to the keynote stage to wrap up day one of API Days interface. Uh, Thank you all so much, all the attendees, for checking out the DX track. And I definitely encourage everybody to go visit the sponsor booths. There's uh, people hanging out in those video rooms all day if you want to go talk to some experts uh, there. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, ooh, it uh, looks like Shelby uh, has a question coming in. So, uh, so Kalia, um, what are your thoughts on making this uh, decentralized approach easy for all groups? 100%. Let's do it. I mean, I'm not really sure. Um, w yes, let's. I, I do want to ask if I'm open to, oh, your grandparents. So let me, okay, this is the thing is I, I've worked with this community for a long time. And when I first um, got connected, um, the... I went to one of the CEOs making these technologies and I went to his office and he showed me a user wallet working where you just clicked on little like cards credentials. And I was like, oh, now we've solved it for grandma. Like it's going to be easy because the, the crypto is all hidden in the UI if you do it right. So it's usable PKI and that's, that's really key, critical. Awesome. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I actually, I, I left, but I came back. Um, I know. But, I was like, oh. I know, yeah. Okay. It, was, it was weird. It was weird. Um, cool. Well, so I, I missed the answer, so apologies about that. But um, It's okay. I have a good answer. <laughs> I'll watch the recording. Awesome. Uh, cool. I, I think we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Shelby, uh, for the question. And again, Kalia, fantastic talk. Uh, everybody, please please put this, the sponsor boots and uh, come back for day two tomorrow. I know that I'm going to be hanging out uh, in the chat, talking to everybody all day tomorrow and, and listening to some fantastic API content. So uh, so thank you all so much and uh, and keep enjoying great API content from home. All right. Thank you. Bye. Cool. Take care, everybody.